So Dana, Michael, and I caught our first snakeheads recently. And what I want to do now is go ahead and cook a couple of them up and give them a try and see how they go as table fare. Now, when we got them home, we got them out back and started filleting them. And they are real thick, meaty fish. And when I started filleting them, I realized that even though they are a scaled fish, they produce quite a bit of mucous membrane, kind of like a catfish. So what I did, I deviated a little bit from the standard way we fillet fish. What I wanted to do was I cut down both sides of the back along the fin there, all the way from the head to the tail. So I wouldn't have to deal with a slippery side after I removed the meat from the first side. Then I went ahead and just did the same method uh, we use for all our other fish. I wanted to be sure to get all the way down to the end of the tail though because the meat goes quite a ways down the frame. As I filleted them I found that their ribs and stomach are very thin which provided a really thick fillet but it was kind of hard to remove from the inside of the skin when I went to skin it and I found instead of just going the whole length of the fish like like we usually do what I did was I made some arcing cuts several arcing cuts and then I'd start over again and that seemed to remove the meat from the skin a lot better without leaving as much behind stuck to the inside of the skin now these fish provided some really big fillets whole pile of meat so we're going to give it a shot we're going to do some snakehead nuggets tonight I've got several of the fillets right here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put these on a cutting board and cut them into about one inch chunks to get started. Now I want to be real careful and try to keep these as much as I can uniform in size. And that way they should all cook at the same rate. They'll take about the same time to cook once I get them into grease. Now you could Use a skillet for this. There's nothing wrong with frying fish in a skillet. But lately, I've been using a big pot to do my frying in. Since coronavirus started, we've been staying home and frying a lot of food at home. So I've been using a big pot. You could use a smaller pan if you wanted to, depending on how much depend on how much food you have but I've been using a big pot because what we've been doing is we've been doing little spurts of fried food to vary our diet between the deer meat and the, the fried fish and when we get to frying we'll do some fish we'll do some chicken I've made a couple of those fried onions like you get at the steakhouse uh, right here at home and they turned out pretty well so I've been using canola oil. It's certainly okay to use vegetable oil, whatever, oil, whatever kind of oil you want to use is fine, but canola oil won't transfer the flavors. So after I cook fish in it, we'll go ahead and fry some chicken tomorrow and it'll still be uh, unique in its flavor. It won't, the fish flavor won't transfer over to the uh, chicken I do tomorrow. But anyway, to get started, we're going to go ahead and pour this into the pan. I'm going to pour the whole jug in here and I'm going to start heating it up. Now one of the things one of the things you're going to want to do with your grease is get it to a good temperature a controlled temperature and to do that you need a thermometer so I've got this grease thermometer here I'm going to go ahead and put it right in to the pan and I'm going to start that oil heating up as I prepare the fish to go in the grease. 
a good temperature, a good round temperature to fry with is about 350. And you'll get a much better finished product if you control the temperature. So I turned the burner on high right now to heat this up. I'm going to watch this thermometer as I work, make sure uh, I stop it when it gets to 350 degrees. I'm going to move on to the fish fry. This fish fry is a mixture of 50% cornmeal and 50% wheat flour. Uh, basically one cup cornmeal, yellow cornmeal, and one cup flour. And I've got it in this Ziploc bag. You can season this up any way you like. You can use it plain, it's fine. You can use a store-bought fish batter if you would like. I mean, they have a lot of good fish fry batter at the grocery, but this I make at home. I'll put a few teaspoons of garlic powder in it. I like a little garlic flavor in my powder. And uh, if you want to, you can put some Old Bay or other seafood seasoning in here to give your fish a little, little zest. Once you've got your batter made up, you want to go ahead and turn your attention to the dredge. Uh, basically what you want to do is you want to mix one egg and a cup of whole milk in a bowl and mix it together real well. Once you've got the egg and the milk mixed together real well, just go ahead and put all your fish nuggets right in here. Trying to get them all in the bowl as you go. Just go ahead and put all your fish nuggets right into the milk and egg and then mix them around real good with a fork to make sure they all get coated. After you've gotten coated with the dredge, we want to go ahead and put them in the batter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my time doing this. I'm keeping a close eye on the temperature of the oil. You don't want to overheat your oil. So I'm watching it to hit 350. But we're going to go ahead and take these fish nuggets out of the batter here and I'm going to lay them in here very carefully right on top and I'm going to make sure that they're separated from each other by a little bit. I'm going to put as many as will fit on the surface of the mixture without touching on the very top of the fish batter. Now what I want to do is go ahead and shake them around. Make sure they get evenly coated with batter and repeat the process with another layer of fish nuggets until we have gone through the entire bowl. Once we've gotten the fish nuggets really well coated, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of shake the excess off them as I pull them out of there with my hand. Now if your oil hits 350 here while you're working, go ahead and turn the burner off. That oil is going to stay really hot once you've heated it up for quite some time. And you don't want to overheat the oil because it'll burn your food. One of the problems with using this method to cook is that when you add your fish or your chicken or whatever you intend to fry, that's going to drop the temperature. That's another reason you turn the burner down or off when the oil is heated. Oh, a little powder fluctuation there. Um, hope we can finish this meal. But when that oil hits 350, turn that burner off. When you add this food, it's going to cool the grease down because the food is cold. If you have your burner on high when you add your food, the oil is going to cool down and it's going to take time to heat back up, which will result in a longer cooking process and a soggier finished product. If you have the burner off and you add your full food into the grease and it begins to cool, you can crank that burner up to high and that sudden burst of energy from the burner will cause the grease to heat right back up really quickly. When you're ready to add your food to the oil, 
you don't want to do it all at once either. You want to do it in little bits. Now you can either put it in piece by piece, slowly, one at a time. And that'll help keep the grease from cooling rapidly. Or you can use a grease ladle like I have here and set it gently down into the grease slowly, making sure it doesn't boil over in the process. Okay, I'm going to crank that back up a little bit because I am losing, I'm down to about 325 now. I cranked the burner on high. That energy as that burner cranks up to high will heat that grease up really quickly. Now you want to make sure you take a long spoon or something here and stir your product around so it doesn't stick together. You do have to use some caution when you add things to grease. Make sure it's not frozen. Make sure it doesn't have a lot of water in the product or on the utensils you're using. Because water will cause this to overboil and you could wind up with fire. Pretty bad one too. You want to be really careful. Try not to splash it because it'll burn the hell out of you. Okay. Now this is only going to take, with those one ounce nuggets, just a few minutes. So I'm going to have to hurry here. I'm going to get a couple plates out, and I'll put some paper towels on them while my fish cooks. Okay, these have been in here for about five, maybe working on six minutes now, and they're getting beautiful. They're golden brown. And the way you're going to be able to tell when these nuggets are done is the rapid boiling action is going to slow down and the fish will float to the surface. And when it does that, you go ahead and skim them off the surface with your ladle. You use a pair of tongs if you don't have a ladle. And go ahead and put them on your paper towel here. You ready to give it a try? Oh good, because I'm hungry. I know, it's kind of late. We've been doing a lot today. But look how nice and gold brown they are. They're really good looking, Looks aren't they? really good. Mm-hmm. You, you going to be brave? You going to give it a try? Fresh oil helps. Yeah, too. fresh oil does make it look... The chicken will look good tomorrow. It didn't get the oil too dirty. I like to cook fish ahead of time. Mm. And chicken. How is it? It's good. What does it taste like? That doesn't even taste like fish. I don't know what it, it has. No, that's good. Very mild. It's wow. That mm. is good stuff. It's still a little hot. It's mm. real firm. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's real it. firm white meat that has no aftertaste whatsoever. Mm -mm. Wow, this is really good. You don't even need tartar sauce or nothing. I'm impressed. That's good fish. It's really good. Real nice. Well, you know what we do with it? Mm. Some coleslaw, maybe? Yeah, look at this. It's it's firm white meat. And it has no fishy aftertaste whatsoever. Wow. You know... We spent a lot of time doing our Search for Perch series this past summer, and I love to eat perch. I mean, that's pretty much what we stock our freezer with for the winter, but I tell you what, these are definitely worth the two-hour drive in the morning down there short of catch them. I think we may be doing some more snakehead fishing in the future. These are really good. Bunch are an invasive species, so they want you to take them out and keep them really good might have to rethink our search for perch next summer <laughs> but uh, we're going to be getting back out on the search for perch i know dana wants to go explore that lake we're at again see if we can the one with all the grass we might be heading up there again but um yeah i think i found another favorite right here well i'm gonna i'm gonna eat before this gets cold these are really good hey Get out and try some fried snakehead of your own if you get a chance. We're going to be getting out there real soon again too. 
We're going to be continuing our search for perch and hunting season is opening up. So I'm going to be getting back in the tree stand pretty soon. I'm sure Dana's going to be heading back to her spot to try to get a few deer for the ice box too. Hey, in the meantime, be sure to check out a few of our other videos. I'll put a few links to them right here at the end of this video. And we would appreciate your subscription and we'd love to hear your comments about what you think about the snakehead fishing here in Maryland. We're Camo Chair Productions. Hope to see you again real soon.